and welcome to another video looking at books for art inspiration. My name's Lee Foster Wilson and I'm an artist and illustrator from Cornwall in the UK. In this series I'm looking at some books from my own collection and how I find them inspiring in relation to making art and the creative process. Each month we look at three books and this month we have this sweet little volume of David Hockney's fairy tale etchings. Um, this one from Design House Marimekko. And lastly, this hefty tome, um, which is an artist monograph about one of my all time favourite artists, Patrick Heron. So let's start with the David Hockney fairy tales. I've had this little book for several years and I did read the fairy tales once upon a time, which are translated from the German originals, but they weren't why I bought the book. It was, of course, because of the lovely etchings. But it happens to be bound so beautifully in this lovely red fabric with the illustration kind of sunken into the cover. I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of sunken in. But yeah, that it happens to be bound like that um, is just a bonus, really. Unfortunately, it is going a little mottled in places because we've had the pleasure of living in a few damp flats and cottages over the years. I'm not sure if you can see that. There's a bit of speckling there. Um, but it's still a beautiful book. And now we live in a properly insulated house. I'm hoping that it won't deteriorate any further. So this book was originally published in 1970, but this edition was reproduced by the Royal Academy... I can't say that. The Royal Academy of Arts... In 2012. So as I said the reason I bought this book was because of the etchings not the fairy tales themselves and I'd heard about and seen these etchings in various books a lot from my student years onwards but I didn't actually get to see them in person until many years later um, when I was visiting some friends in Brighton. I can't even remember where it was it was kind of upstairs in this little room somewhere but I do remember that the etchings themselves are sort of A3 or A2 size. Um, so these reproductions are tiny in comparison. Um, however, I still love them just as much. Come back to this one in a minute. Um, the fairy tales themselves are quite dark and weird, as the Brothers Grimm tends to be. And I think Hockney captured that so well. They're definitely not for children, these drawings. That's so scary. <laughs> But I just love how they're made with such a range of marks. You have these kind of thick black areas and kind of quite tight lines mixed with much more scribbly, scumbly areas. And then these really delicate ones too. I think there's one near the back of Rumpelstiltskin kind of getting his comeuppance. Let me find it. Mm, I think it's further back. There he is. I'll hold it up a bit. So it's kind of got this like weird, weird fairy tales. It reminds me of um, Not Now Bernard, that kid's book from, I think it was the 70s and 80s. So it's kind of got, it's very strange. There's some really strange bits in there. But then there's also some just really beautiful bits. I think what I like most about them though is what he has left out rather than what he's put in and this one here a kind of classic of just a chair and the curtains and the window again drawn with this lovely delicacy really simple line and on first read of the story it doesn't really seem to have a lot to do with the story but it kind of sets the scene as the home of the protagonists and you don't really need to see them in it you can just see the the scene and their home where they live and I kind of like that abstraction and then there's this one too from Rapunzel I just love how you know it's a walled garden but there's no detail on the walls at all but your eye is drawn towards this woman longingly looking down into the vegetables and I love these ones too the scary enchantress and there she is with Rapunzel as a baby. But look at her, she's terrifying. She's got really hairy boobs. <laughs> Just There's a lot of humour in these drawings as well as the kind of darkness too. 
And there's a spareness again with this tower. And I love this one of the prints. We can't see his face, but we can see Rapunzel's hair and we all know the story, so we know what he's doing there. And then, what are these ones I've marked? We've got some of my favorites here. Um, trying to, this one here, I think is my absolute favorite. I'll try and hold it up a bit closer. So this one of the glass mountain is one of the first that drew me into the series and the fraction of the house through the glass just brought about with such a few lines. It's just stunning. And the tree here as well, beautiful. And then there's these other ones that I said I'd come back to. I kind of look at transparency and showing something on the inside, but from the outside. It's this person in the fish here. I really love these two as well. The unsuspecting bird looking in the giant egg, not knowing there's a human inside. And then there's also these ones here, which reference some of Hockney's early work where he explored the idea of a still image being a snapshot of a moment before all hell breaks loose. Like this big cat pouncing. This guy looks so calm. All this water being sloshed in someone's face. And while the image is still, they're safe, but we know what's about to happen. And I've always loved that idea something that Hockney played with a few times in his work. So that's that lovely little book. As I say, it was just a way for me to get hold of some of these etchings and have them to refer to whenever I'm sort of feeling, what can I draw? How would, Pop How would Hockney draw a fairy tale? <laughs> that sort of thing. of the Edward Gorey about them at times as well. I'll show you some Edward Gorey books soon. I love them. There's the glass mountain being broken. So yeah, that's that one. Lovely little book. So let's move on to the Marameco book. Um, you've probably heard of Marameco, but if you haven't, they're a pattern design house based in Helsinki in Finland. And you will likely have seen their collaborations with companies like Uniqlo and Ikea. I'm sure there's been more as well. Um, and you've a lot, probably seen countless rip-offs of their beautiful patterns as well. Um, they have several designers working for them on fabric patterns and homewares. And while the aesthetic varies between their designers, somehow you can always tell it's a Marameco print. And I kind of find that the use of scale tends to be a giveaway. As you can see in the background there, huge prints. They tend to go really bold and large. That's a really tiny picture, you probably can't see that. Let me find another one. Here we go. So there's no kind of like tiny ditzy prints here. It's all big, bold colours. Let me find some more, like this lady's wearing here. Here we go. Huge, bold, bright, graphic, lovely prints. And their homewares too tend to have a Scandi feel about them. Um, even though minimalism isn't really Marameco's thing, you just kind of definitely have that Scandinavian vibe to them. And I just really love their patterns. So going back to the actual book, um, I have a couple of Marameco books, but what I love particularly about this one, In Patterns, um, is that it starts off with a bit of behind the scenes of Marameco and looks at their highlights and goes through their history over the last 60 years. So it, teaches, it tells you a little bit about the process of fabric printing and the process of picking colours. Imagine working in there, all those lovely samples and fabric colours to choose from. But it also, in the middle of it, 
it highlights each of their designers um, and designers of their classic patterns over from the last sort of 60 years and also their current designers who were working for them at the time of publication which was 2014. And I don't know about you but I absolutely love reading about other artists and their studios and their creative process and the way they work and that is why I just love this book. It looks inside the studios and the processes of 11 different designers plus as I mentioned, there are three classic ones at the beginning. Oh, look, there's some of the big, bold prints. But there's also, I should have put a note on it. There's a bit here. I love this bit. So this is a really classic Marimekko print. I've actually got a T-shirt from their Uniqlo collaboration with this print on it in a different colourway. But it's one of my favourite T-shirts. Um, so they've also applied these same design to these homewares. But there's just such a nice story running through them and it's called the In Good Company Collection which was made in 2009 and they are based on this pattern which was it says here was designed with sort of allotment gardening and urban gardening in mind um, and so this was designed by Sami Rotsalinen which I'm probably pronouncing very wrong um, but she says she used this unique pattern for each piece in the collection and the patterns create a story as you move from cup to bowl to from plate to mug. It's about leaving your city apartment, so there's the city, and visiting an allotment, and there's the allotment, where you can get a glimpse of flower and vegetable beds and a colourful rag rug greets visitors inside the allotment cottage. Isn't that lovely? I just love that there's such a narrative woven throughout these designs. They're not just kind of put on there because they look pretty which they probably are as well, but <laughs> they kind of have this thread running through them. So each one's different, but they're all tied together with that lovely, lovely narrative. So if you love pattern or inspired by reading about how other artists work, then I think you will love this book a lot. It's just such a great inspirational resource as well as having those interviews and the um, written pieces in it. A very enjoyable book. So lastly we have this giant which is a monograph about Patrick Heron who I mentioned earlier is one of my favourite artists ever. I actually have this book twice and another book about him too. Um, this isn't it but the original one I got when I was doing my A-levels and I wrote my final project on his work. And a few years later, when I was doing my fine art degree, Mel Gooding, the author of this book, came um, into our college. He sadly passed away um, in 2001, but he came into our college to talk to us about our second year art exhibition. And I was absolutely starstruck because he'd obviously written one of my favourite books. Um, but I think I told him I had it, had this book and he said some nice things about my work. So that back then, that was just the best thing. So this lovely big book spans Heron's career from the very early beginnings, designing these silk scars for his father's company, right through to the work he was making, that's the very end, in his later years. So Patrick Heron lived and worked in Cornwall and became known as what was part of the what was, known, what was known as the St Ives School, like in the 50s and 60s, alongside artists like Barbara Hepworth, Ben Nicholson, um, Roger Hilton, Bernard Leach, Terry Frost, all those artists that worked in and around St Ives. And one thing that I remember from writing about him back then was his absolute love of the light around St Ives. And that just finds its way into his work in abundance, I think. So if you don't know anything about St Ives, it's a coastal town um, on a north facing headland here in Cornwall and it's pretty much surrounded by sea sort of all around the two sides of it and people quite often mention the light in St Ives being really special and something to do with the light bouncing off the sea on both sides and kind of meeting in the middle and it just has this lovely Christmas to it even on like a really dull grey day in the middle of winter St Ives just seems brighter than everywhere else and I've been there in all weathers um, and it's a real haven for artists because of this. 
So what I think drew me to Patrick Heron's work in the first place, oh, I love these ones. Anyway, where was I? Um, yeah, what I think drew me to his work in the first place was kind of his mid-career work, which is sort of around here, I think, when he was sort of in his late 30s, 40s. Um, and it was just about the colour, his use of colour. And again, all the space in them, the space in Hockney's work, the space in this work. And really seeing them in the book just doesn't do them justice because some of these are really big. And in person, they're just so rich and full of depth and you feel like you could just dive right into them. They kind of look really soft. Um, but seeing them in here in the book just reminds me of how I felt when I first saw them in person. And I've been lucky enough to see two retrospectives of his work, one in London when I was a student and the other a few years ago, again in St Ives. Um, but last time I saw them, I actually got a little bit emotional. They're just so, so vibrant and just beautiful in person, absolutely stunning. So his work is kind of all about abstracting the shapes of the world around him and the light playing across the rocks and the rock pools and shifting sands and the shape of the coastline and the inlets. And you can kind of combine this with the balancing of colours, sort of playing them off against each other to make some more vivid and others recede. I just love the depth in that one there. There's one that I don't think is in this book that I saw at um, the Tate retrospective and it was kind of blues lots of blues like this and there was this one very vivid orange line down one side and I remember looking at it and thinking if that line wasn't there this painting would be completely different it's just that one line completely changed it and sadly I don't think it's here maybe I'll try and find it and put it as an overlay but it's yeah it's one of those you just when you realize the power of one simple bit of color and how much it can change, change your perspective of the painting. I think looking at Heron's work and looking at these canvases is kind of where my love of colour and finding balance within it in a composition really started. Like some of these ones, let me find these ones, these sort of harder ones are kind of, um, they're absolutely huge, some of them, like 15 foot. And in real life, they just seem to kind of vibrate or where the edges are softer they seem to invite you to just fall inside them it's just such a great in-depth book like these essays are really long very in-depth so if you want to learn more about Patrick Heron, this is the book to get, honestly. It's got everything. So as we come to the later part of the book, which I did mention earlier, there he is as he got a bit older. Um, we come to his later work. And I wasn't really taken with these when I was younger when I first got into his work. But as I've got older, I've come to just appreciate them more and more. And I think now they are my favourites. Look who's here. He always joins us when we're trying to film something. Oscar. He's been poorly this week, so I need to be nice to him. Okay. Every time. I guarantee Oscar will join us. Maybe he just loves books as much as I do. So where was I? I was saying that these later paintings, wasn't I, that I didn't really appreciate them as much when I was younger, but I really like them now. And I just find, after this harder work, harder, I don't know why I call it harder, harder edged work. Where are we? These big ones here, all about balancing colour. The edges are just starting to soften here again. And there's kind of more of a playfulness with the spots and the, da the sort of dashed lines. And these watercolours as well, or gouache, sorry gouache on paper, handmade paper no less. But these ones with the dashes and there's a real lightness to them compared to that earlier work. And if we turn to this one, 
and then you can turn to these sketches here you can kind of see where these more linear forms start to come from the sketchbook work I find that really interesting again it's all about the process and how people see the world endlessly fascinating so there you go that is one of my favourite books in my collection. One I return to just to soak up some painterly goodness and colour. <clears throat> and different ways of appreciating the shapes of the world around you, really. I don't think I actually showed you his very early work, so let's go back and just have a quick look. So these ones where he kind of outlined and then painted within the lines all very very good and lovely as well so yeah there we are that is that one <laughs> so yeah there you go this book is just a wonderful ode to color and a really in-depth look at a fascinating artist's life so there we finish with this month's books david hockney fairy tale with the etchings and in patterns by marimekko and patrick heron by mel gooding and please do let me know if there are any themes or art styles you'd like to see books on. And I will take a look to see if we've got any along those lines in our collection for me to share with you. Thanks so much for watching. And if you haven't seen any of the others in the series, please do go and check them out. And don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time.